right, so hello everyone. Welcome today um, to my PhD defense. I can't believe I'm saying that, but it has been, um, and it's been enough time now that we're doing this. So today we're going to talk about planet-planet interactions and exoplanet systems. We're going to talk about just some background uh, for this work, and then we'll talk about nodal precession, period ratio sculpting, and relative habitability. And hopefully by the end of this talk, all of these concepts will make sense. <laughs> So to begin with, planetary dynamics is my field, and that sounds kind of esoteric, but really, if you look at it, it's just saying, hey, see those objects that are moving relative to the other stars? What's making them do that? Can we predict their motion? And this is also called celestial mechanics, which I think sounds even cooler, and I like to say that I consider myself a celestial mechanic. <laughs> So one of the things I really love about this field is that it has a history as long as humankind. So most of the planets of the solar system are incredibly bright, they're incredibly easy to spot, and it's very easy to see that they are doing things in the sky that the other points of light just aren't. Like this example of Mars going retrograde across the sky. So naturally, humans have always been trying to explain and predict this behavior, although admittedly more along the lines of astrology than astronomy for a very long time. And there are two people who really brought this study of planetary dynamics into its modern form as a scientific field. And the first is Johannes Kepler. So he took this amazing data set that had been created by Tycho Brahe, and he tried to create a model to explain these observed motions, which resulted in his famous laws of planetary motion, which I've listed here for you. And you don't have to worry about all the details here, but when I say famous, I mean, I can only hope that in 400 years, someone is making a webcomic about my work. They almost certainly won't be, but. <laughs> um, and this vision that Kepler had of these elliptical orbits, which was a really um, kind of new idea at the time, is still used today. And in this talk, I will be referencing frequently what are called Keplerian orbital elements. So I will just give you a quick rundown of what these orbital elements are. So from Kepler, we know that an orbit is an ellipse. And so we can define the orbit by six independent orbital elements, which basically tell us that how big the ellipse is, how circular the ellipse is, and how it's tilted and oriented in three-dimensional space. So for the first of these, how big is the ellipse? We need to either know its period, that is how long it takes the planet to go around once, or its semi-major axis, which is just half the long diameter of the ellipse. For example, Earth's orbital period is one year, and its semi-major axis is one AU. And from Kepler's third law, we actually know that we can convert between these quantities, so they're not independent quantities, they're telling us the same thing, basically. So for how circular the um, orbit is, we usually would want to know the eccentricity of the orbit. You can think of eccentricity as a percentage of the distortion from a circle. So an eccentricity of zero is a circular orbit, and as you get closer to one, you get more and more elliptical until you kind of get infinitely close to one and you get these extreme orbits. Now, if you actually reach one, then you are in an unbound orbit and that's beyond what we're gonna be talking about today. Okay, so for the orientation of the orbit, there are a bunch of different angles that we can use. So this is a diagram that shows it in a little bit more detail. And if you're keeping track, you'll notice that I said we need six unique elements and I've only covered two. So that means we need at least four angles. Now, because these are angles, they have to be measured relative to some reference. And you can choose really anything you want to be the reference, but there are some choices that might be a little bit more logical than other choices. So for the reference direction, for example, if you're looking at another planetary system, you might make this reference direction the line of sight between um, Earth and that system. For the reference plane, you could maybe consider um, the plane that's equal with the equator of the star. You might consider one of the planet's orbital planes. Um, or you could do something called the invariable plane. The invariable plane is just the plane that's perpendicular to the system's total angular momentum vector. Total angular momentum is conserved, so this plane is always constant, hence invariable. Okay, so this first angle here is uppercase omega, and it's the longitude of ascending node, where ascending node is just this point where the orbit passes upward, hence ascending, through the reference plane. This is measured in the reference plane from the reference direction. Also, if you're paying attention, you might be like, wait, node, didn't you say we're gonna talk about nodal precession? Yes, gold star for you and hold on to that thought. Um, next, we have lowercase omega, which is the argument of periapsis. So periapsis is just the point in the orbit that the planet is closest to the star. This is measured relative to the uh, reference plane where the ascending node is in the orbital plane. And then we have inclination here, I, which is just the angle that the orbital plane makes with the reference plane. And then lastly, we have true anomaly nu, 
Um, and so this is the angle of the planet's location at some given point in time, measured relative, oops, measured relative to the periapsis. So the previous five parameters basically tell you exactly what the ellipse that is the orbit looks like. And then this true anomaly, anomaly tells you where you can actually find the planet at any given point in time. Okay, so thanks to Kepler, we know about the kinds of orbits that planets have. But why do they have orbits like that? Well, enter our boy Isaac Newton now. So as the story goes, one day he's sitting there being assaulted by apples. And the next thing you know, Newton's law of universal gravitation. So what this tells us is the actual mathematical form that the force between the planets and the sun takes. And this actually gives rise to the laws that Kepler had observed about 80 years before this. Now, some of you might be wondering, OK, but we know that Newton's theory of gravity is wrong. It's just an approximation. And indeed, sometimes general relativity does matter on planetary orbital scales. But for, for the purposes of this talk, we're just going to be sticking to Newtonian gravity. And it's always good to remember that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And this is a very useful model. So if you just had an isolated star with one planet orbiting it, they are pulling on one, one another gravitationally. The orbit of this planet would be Keplerian, and it would just continue on in this perfect Keplerian orbit forever and ever perfectly. But if you add another planet into the system, well, now you've introduced additional gravitational forces. Now, the star is much more massive than the planets, so these forces are going to be kind of the dominant forces, but that doesn't mean that this is a negligible force. Sometimes it is. Sometimes the effects between the planets are really, really minor, but they can be really strong. They can even destabilize the system entirely. And one thing that's really important to note is that even though we can write this out and it looks relatively simple, that's actually very deceptive because all of these R's here are different. They're all different um, distances and different in whatever coordinate system you choose. And the R changes over time and it changes over time based on this force. So this is actually a really complicated system of equations. And it turns out that you cannot, it's literally impossible to mathematically write out the exact way that the planet's positions will change over time. So this is called the three-body problem, and scientists have been chewing on this problem since Newton. So it's, it's a big deal. <laughs> and there are basically two paths you can take to solve the three-body problem, at least to solve it as well as we can, since we know it's impossible to solve it perfectly. So we can go down the analytical path, trying to come up with equations that approximate the behavior of the system. Or we can go down the numerical path, which basically just uses computers to kind of brute force solve the equations of motions for the system. Now, obviously, analytical approximations were the name of the game for many centuries because, well, no computers. <laughs> but nowadays, computing power is cheap and abundant. And so we can use numerical methods more than ever to really help us understand the three body problem. But both methods are actually quite important. And not just for solving the three body problem, but in fact, for solving the n body problem, where now you can just have really as many planets as you want. Okay, so you're thinking, Nora, that explains the planet planet interactions part, but why exoplanet systems? Is, is gravity different in exoplanet systems? Are the orbits different? Well, no, uh, gravity is the same everywhere as far as we know. Um, but the solar system was really the only example of a planetary system that we had for centuries. And so it has been very intensely studied, um, but now we have exoplanet systems. So just in the last 30 years, this has finally given us new systems to observe and learn about. And it turns out that a lot of these systems are nothing like this, nothing like what the solar system is. So this is a plot just showing some of the known exoplanet systems compared to the planets of the solar system. And so you can see that these exoplanet systems are really different from the solar system, both in the properties of the planets themselves. You can see this whole region here, a very common type of exoplanet that's called um, super Earths or mini Neptunes that just don't exist in the solar system. There's really nothing between Venus and Earth and Uranus and Neptune. But also in the orbital properties, so this very wide range of some major axes, and in fact, um, a very wide range of eccentricities and a very wide range of inclinations in exoplanet systems. And this means that a lot of these tools, especially the analytical ones that were designed with the problem of the solar system in mind, maybe don't work quite so well for exoplanet systems, which actually brings us to the first project that I want to tell you about today, which is nodal precession. So if you're interested, you can learn a lot more about this in a paper that was published back in 2020. Well, it will also be in the thesis, but that's not published yet. So. <laughs> Um, so, okay, this goes back to the idea of the longitude of the ascending node. So nodal precession is basically just this angle, omega, changing over time. So to make things easy, I'm going to take the invariable plane to be the reference plane here. So remember, that means that the system's total angular momentum vector would be straight up in this diagram. And if you drew a vector that was perpendicular to the orbital plane as well, 
This basically means that that vector was making little circles around the total angular momentum vector. So this might be a little bit hard to look at. So I made this little cartoon to show you what a nodal precession kind of looks like. But this is just a cartoon because, again, you only have a single planet here. So there is no reason that it would be nodally processing. And also, generally, nodal precession is not going to be this fast. But this is the idea of what it looks like as a node, um, as a node processes. So you might wonder, well, how fast do the orbits process then? And what I can tell you from what I did in this work is that the rate of the nodal precession depends on eccentricity and inclination. And really importantly, that dependence is stronger for lower period ratios. So the period ratio is just the ratio of the periods of two planets, outer over inner, so that it's always greater than one. So low period ratio means planets that are very close together. Alternatively, you could also just say for higher alpha. So alpha is the ratio of the semi-major axes, inner over outer, so that it's always less than one. So higher alpha is the same oops, as lower period ratios. They both just mean planets that are close together. Okay, so obviously I'm far from the first person to study the rate of nodal precession. And in particular, the, these two 18th century mathematicians developed this analytical framework that is still heavily used today to describe the secular evolution of multi-planet systems called classical linear secular theory. Now, secular here doesn't have anything to do with religion. It's a secondary meaning that basically means things that happen on long time scales. What this means is that we're basically going to be ignoring short time scales, things like where exactly the planets are located within their orbits, and instead are looking more at like how the orbits as a whole interact with one another. And the linear part here means linear algebra, so matrices and eigenfrequencies. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> so from this theory, you can uh, find what the rate of nodal precession for two planets is. And um, you don't need to get caught up in the particulars of this equation here. But what you might notice is that there is no dependence on E, no dependence on I, and very little dependence on alpha. So let me show you the reference that I got this from. Notice the title here. So in the solar system, um, there is very little eccentricity or inclination, and the planets aren't super close together. So this approximation works relatively well. But how does it do um, with different types of planetary systems? So I compared this uh, analytical solution to our more costly but more accurate numerical tools. And so I did a whole grid of simulations with two planets to find out um, specifically what the nodal precession period was. And this is what I found. So the y-axis here is just showing the measured period from the simulation compared to the calculated period from the theory as a fractional difference. Um, and on the left, uh, the planets are circular, but we're changing the inclination. And on the right, the uh, planets are almost, but not quite coplanar. Um, if the inclination is zero, you don't have a node, so that's impossible to do nodal precession. Um, and then the eccentricity is changing. And um, so the zero line here would mean that it was exactly equal to what we expected from the analytical theory. Um, and what you can see, <laughs> that's not the case. So each dot here represents simulation. The color of the dot is showing us the period ratio. So these kind of dark purple ones are very close together. These yellow ones are very far apart. So when you say inclination, you mean the relative inclination? Yes. Okay, so we see that there is a lot of dependence on both inclination and eccentricity, and that dependence changes quite significantly with what the actual period ratio is. So clearly, the analytical theory needs to include some more dependence on E and I. And so this has actually been tackled by other dynamicists in various fashions, including this recent approximation for omega dot, which is just um, the change in omega over time. And this is promising because it starts with Laplace Lagrange theory here, and then it actually incorporates an inclination dependence and eccentricity dependence. And this dependence is squared, which seems good with what we saw before because this isn't increasing linearly, right? It's kind of taking off a little bit. Um, and it's positive for I and negative for E, which again, matches what we saw in our simulations. So that's, that's great. But what you don't see here is any additional dependence on alpha or the period ratio, which clearly, is needed. So what are we going to do? Go to even higher order? Yes, in fact, we are. <laughs> and so we uh, go back to our trusty Bible here. Um, and this is about to get very mathy. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm not asking you to do any. And I'm just, hopefully, we'll talk you through it. OK, so we start with this, which is uh, Lagrange's equation of planetary motion for the node. And this looks relatively simple. You're probably thinking, Nora, that really didn't call for that excessive <laughs> warning. But again, this is deceptive because this R here is actually the disturbing function. And um, I won't get into the details here, but basically it's a, a way to describe how an, um, an orbit changes, how it departs from a perfectly two-body orbit. And now, because we know the three-body problem is unsolvable, we can't write R out 
Exactly. So we have to approximate it in some way. And this is not actually a trivial thing to do. So in Murray and Dermot, the fourth order approximation of the disturbing function actually takes 17 pages to list out. <laughs> um, and I had to take that huge expansion and then take a derivative of it and like combine it with other things. So um, luckily there's a few things that we can do to simplify it. And I'm not gonna go into the details, but this is what you end up getting um, for your relative derivative here, where S now is um, the sign of I over two. Um, and this again is a little bit deceptive because all of these F functions are actually <laughs> equations of their own. And each of these B things in here also need to be calculated. Okay, so this is it. This is the full, <laughs> this is the full thing that I did. Um, and again, we don't really need to worry about the details here, but what you might notice is that we do have more dependence on E and I, um, and it's actually squared dependence, so that's good. Um, and now we have a lot of dependence on alpha, because in fact, all of this, everything from here down, that only depends on alpha. So we have a lot of uh, dependence on alpha. And in fact, you may notice if you have a very keen eye that we also have some dependence on lowercase omega, which is the orientation of the orbit, um, like see here. And in fact, this is kind of a good example of why analytical tools are still so helpful because I did not realize that until I actually did this. This was not clear from the simulations. Um, and so it actually helped me understand some things I was seeing in the simulations better. So yeah, analytical tools are not um, outdated, I guess I would say. Okay, so now with this whole thing, how does this compare back to our simulated data? Okay, so um, a lot better, <laughs> I think. So I'm showing here just uh, plotting for a few different period ratios, what these dependencies look like. And I'm also showing in this gray dashed line, that kind of low alpha approximation I showed you earlier that didn't really include any explicit dependence on alpha. So you can see that that matches this kind of very low uh, or high period ratio, low alpha regime, which makes sense. That's what it was designed to do, but it does not in any way capture this dependence on period ratio. And of course, this is just showing one instance of E and I, but you can combine them together in lots of different ways and calculate what the um, expected period would be. And this is what we find in it. You know, it's doing pretty well, I think. <laughs> but how well? If we, um, so if we care about the accuracy of our analytical solution to within a factor of two, which might not sound um, all that great, but this is astronomy, so that's actually pretty decent. Um, Metal plus Lagrange theory is probably okay. Really, any of them do a pretty good job, unless the planets are like super close together, in which case you're almost certainly going to be needing numerical um, simulations. But if you care to a factor of 1%, then you really need to include that whole mess of stuff that I showed earlier. Um, I tried experimenting with taking out various terms, and really all of them matter, I guess <laughs> I would say. So why would you care, though, about what this nodal procession rate is? <laughs> well, there are many reasons. For starters, it's just really cool, I think. But there is actually a more um, applicable reason that's related to the concept of resonance. So resonance actually happens in many different ways. And it's basically an amplified effect that you get when you're applying some forcing frequency uh, for force that has a frequency um, similar to a natural frequency of the system on which it acts. So you may have seen something like this and maybe a high school physics class or something. This is a really famous example. This is the collapse of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, although actually engineers debate whether this was due to resonance or not. But in any case, I think it illustrates the idea uh, very nicely. So you can see there's a very outsized effect. Um, but in this case, we're not talking about wind blowing on a bridge. We're talking about these nodal precession frequencies among the planets of a multi-planet system. So you can get what's called a secular resonance when these frequencies start to match one another. So for example, if you had a simplified solar system that consisted only of Jupiter and Saturn and a test particle, which is just a particle that has no mass but experiences gravity, um, you can kind of think of it just like an asteroid. Um, the test particle gets some amount of forced inclination in its orbit, depending on its location. So this is the force inclination and the test particle's location. And this changes over time, which I'm showing here as it changes over time, but you can see that these kind of two locations where the inclination gets forced to these really, really high values. And that's because the test particles nodal precession frequency is matching the nodal precession frequency of these two planets. And now I've used just Laplace-Lagrange theory to calculate this, but I just told you how wrong Laplace-Lagrange theory can get these frequencies, which in turn means it can get those locations very wrong. So I actually applied this then in a real system with known planets to see how the location of the secular resonance for a test particle would change depending on the test particle's eccentricity. So here I'm showing the locations of those inner and outer resonance locations. So the Laplace Lagrange is kind of shown here in bluish purple, um, and, and it doesn't have any dependence on eccentricity, right? So it's just going to be the same no matter what. And then I'm showing the two approximations that we talked about here, where the kind of very long one is this one right here. And what you can see is for the interior resonance, 
the uncertainties, which mostly come from the observational uncertainties on the system, means that the difference is just not going to really be noticeable. But for this exterior resonance, that definitely changes significantly the location of the secular resonance, and you need to take into account these higher order terms in order to capture that dependence. So hopefully now you understand that the rate of nodal precession does depend on eccentricity and inclination, and then that dependence gets very amplified for these low period ratios, which does apply to planets similar to those found by Kepler. Wait, this guy found exoplanets? No, this guy found exoplanets. So this is the Kepler Space Telescope, which um, conducted the Kepler mission. Um, so when I refer to Kepler, I'm generally talking about the mission, which ran from 2009 to 2013. It observed about 180,000 target stars and discovered almost 5,000 planet candidates and about 3,000 confirmed exoplanet candidates. So one of the really great things about Kepler is that it discovered this large collection of multi-planetary systems, enough that we can start looking at not just individual systems like Kepler-117, but at the population as a whole. And so that's what I did for this NEST project to try and learn something about the eccentricity of Kepler multis from the period ratio distribution. And again, there is an associated paper that you can read for a lot more detail. So as it turns out, what we did learn was that the um, Kepler planets, at least those near these uh, second order resonances, have relatively low eccentricity distributions. Now, this was not a surprising finding as other studies have found similar things in the past, but the method that we used was entirely new and independent. So it's really helping us build this robust picture of Kepler multis. And we did this using period ratio sculpting and going back to the concept of resonance. But this time, instead of being interested in secular frequencies and when they match, we're interested in the orbital frequencies of the planets. And this happens on very different time scales. So to give an idea, for Jupiter and Saturn, the Laplace-Lagrange theory nodal precession frequency is this, which is, corresponds to a period of over 50,000 years, whereas their orbital frequencies are a lot, lot faster. Um, and this is about 11 and 30 years, respectively. And in fact, Kepler planets have even faster frequencies because their orbital periods tend to be more in the days range than the years. So this type of resonance between orbital frequencies is called mean motion resonance. And since planets don't usually have exactly the same orbit, so the frequencies aren't going to exactly equal one another, instead we're going to be interested in places where integer multiples of the frequencies actually equal one another. So this is an example of what that looks like um, for a two to one mean motion resonance. So this means the outer planet is going around once and the inner planet goes around twice in that same time. Now, um, for a second or a two to one MMR, the period ratio is two, and the resonance is what we call a first order mean motion resonance because two minus one equals one. But in this project, we were actually interested in second order mean motion resonances, in particular the five to three and the three to one, which you can see. Second order, right? <laughs> okay, so this is what the period ratio looks like for the entire multi planet distribution of Kepler. And you can see that this isn't just a flat distribution. There's a lot of sculpting going on here, which is what we want to study. But rather than looking at this whole distribution and how it's sculpted, we're interested in just these small regions around these two resonances. So why? What makes these narrow slices so interesting? And what does any of this have to do with eccentricity, which I haven't even talked about? <laughs> well, it turns out this is related to the resonance shape. So if you have a resonance, for example, at three to one, the period ratio doesn't have to be exactly three for the planets to be in the resonance. That is, the resonance has some sort of width to it. And for second order mean motion resonance, it turns out that this width depends on the eccentricity of the planets. And it looks something like this, where that it gets wider as the eccentricity gets higher. So what this means is that for a pair of planets with high eccentricity, they might be located within the resonance, but a pair of planets at the same period ratio but less eccentricity might be outside the resonance. And now, this period ratio isn't exactly constant over time, and this goes back to this gravitational nudges between the planets. It changes that period ratio slightly. And when you're in the resonance, the change happens around the center of the resonance, which is not the case for some planet pair that is outside the resonance. So if you looked not just at this point in time to find this period ratio, but at an average over time, you would find that the period ratio for those planets within the resonance would kind of approach the exact center of the resonance. So this is a little bit abstract, so let me show you an actual example of some of the data from this project. So there are two different systems of two planets here, um, and this one has kind of high eccentricity, and this one has moderate eccentricity, and then I've just integrated over time. And you can see, in fact, that this high eccentricity pair is kind of going around the center of the resonance, while this guy is just hanging out uh, a little bit inward of the resonance. 
it's a little bit clearer to see if we just plot all of these points at once. So you can see how the uh, motion over time in this period ratio eccentricity space changes. And if you took an average over time, you can see that the period ratio average for this pair falls much closer to the center of the resonance than it does for this pair, even though at some point in time they did have the same period ratio. So imagine now I'm doing this not for just two planets, but for a whole population of planets, you can see now that you might get some sculpting of the period ratio distribution. And it's dependent on this eccentricity. And what's important to keep in mind is that eccentricity, we don't get that from Kepler data, but we do get the period ratio. So you can begin to see how we can tease out information about eccentricity using the period ratio distribution near these second order resonances. So to see what this would actually look like for a large population of planets, I created two sets of synthetic uh, populations. Uh, one near three to one and one near five to three. And I'll skip the details of how I did this, but long story short, there are a few hundred planet pairs in each population. And the goal here is to create a large data set of planet pairs with properties similar to those planets observed by Kepler's, except with a large range of eccentricities that we can use later to help us create subsets with specific eccentricity distributions. So once I had these pairs, I integrated them using n-body simulations for three and a half years. Um, this is because this is the minimum amount of time we would expect to observe planets over the Kepler mission. And then we averaged the period ratios over time of the simulation. So we're basically doing this for every single one of those hundreds of planet pairs. And what that allows us to do is compare the average period ratio distribution with kind of an instantaneous distribution. So just picking one point in time. And what we expect to see is that if you have a lot of eccentricity, which we do in this population, the average distribution will have a very clear peak right at the exact center of the residence location. Ta-da! <laughs> Don't you love it when things just like turn out exactly the way you expect? It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> so this is really great. Um, but what we wanted to do is kind of take these results and model them. Not this kind of model, unfortunately. This kind of model. <laughs> So this is a mathematical description of that period ratio distribution. Yes, sorry, more math. I do that kind of a lot, but this isn't that bad. So this denominator is just a normalization factor, so we don't really need to worry about it. And then what's left here is just this kind of linear background, which is uh, this term with the constant, and then a Gaussian peak at the exact center of the resonance, the so-called bell curve, right? And to give you an idea of kind of what I'm talking about here, I mean, okay, kind of linear background, Gaussian peak, you kind of see how you get the overall resulting distribution. But this is just me sketching it by eye to illustrate it. What we actually did was use a uh, routine called Markov Chain Monte Carlo to figure out what values of these three parameters actually fit our data the best. And this is what we found. Um, so we were able to kind of recreate our data set pretty well. And then rather than look at all three of these individual parameters that we fit, we can actually combine them into a single value that quantifies what fraction of the planet pairs are actually inside the peak versus in the linear background. And when we do that, unsurprisingly, we find, because um, we can see by eye that it exists, <laughs> that the, uh, the peaks contain a significant fraction of the planet pairs. Okay, but remember, this is just for those hundreds of made up planets that have that wide range of eccentricity. What about the actual Kepler data? Well, this is what that looks like. Um, so this is the Kepler data and then a model we fit from that data in the same way. And you'll probably immediately notice that the data is much less clear here. Well, we've gone from hundreds of planet pairs to tens of planet pairs. And you also might notice that this model is kind of doing an iffy job of fitting this data. So I'm showing this here as a histogram and a PDF because I think it's more intuitive with the whole concept of the linear background and the peak, but we can look at this as a CDF to kind of eliminate any binning but maybe that didn't help. <laughs> so let me show, explain what I'm showing here. So we're still seeing the data in blue from the Kepler planets. Um, and I'm still showing the median model here in black. But now what I'm showing in gray is actually subsample or samples that were selected from this uh, median model with the same number of planets um, as are in the data set. And so what you can see here is that the reason this model or the primary reason that this model is kind of struggling is because we just don't have very many planets. So this is mostly a sample size thing. And so we do actually have a model that is consistent with the data. And so we can use that model to calculate a fractional uh, peak. And this is what we find for the Kepler data. And so in this case, we can see that these peaks are basically not significant. So if, if eccentricity is what gives us a nice, beautiful peak, and we don't see nice, beautiful peaks for Kepler, that means probably these planets are not very eccentric. 
So to quantify that, we can kind of try to constrain the eccentricity scale. And so to do that, we go back to this library of our, our uh, hundreds of planet pairs that we created, and we start checking out samples from the library based on their eccentricity. So we pick those samples to be consistent with a known eccentricity distribution, but then we fit the period ratio distribution. So we're choosing based on eccentricity, but we're fitting the period ratio. And when we do that for a whole wide range of scales, this is what we find. So the x-axis here is the scale of the individual um, eccentricity distribution for each planet. And the y-axis is the peak area that we found from fitting a model to that data. And you can see that these very high eccentricity scales are just completely inconsistent with the Kepler data. But on the lower end, um, you know, we can't really distinguish between some of these scales. So what this allows us to do is actually place an upper limit on this Raleigh scale. And I've shown some of the confidence levels here with vertical lines. So the two sigma line, which is 95% confidence, gives us this scale of eccentricity for each of these um, resonances. And so we know that the Kepler planets have an eccentricity distribution with a scale less than this, <laughs> which brings us back to our point for this uh, section. And so we do have a relatively low um, eccentricity distribution. I've just plotted here what this looks like for the combined eccentricity of the two planets compared with some other previous results. So consistent with previous results. Um, so we've seen how these planet-planet interactions can have effects on very long and very short time scales. And we've mostly been looking at kind of small effects, right, with little nudges between the planets. But I did mention that those effects can be quite significant. You can even make systems unstable due to these um, planetary interactions. So in this last project, I wanted to bring together kind of all of these ideas, short and long time scales, large and small effects, and see how that affects the habitability of an exoplanet like the Earth. Um, and this paper is not available for you to read yet, but it has been submitted, so hopefully soon. <laughs> Um, so habitability is just the measure of how well suited something is for life. So here on Earth, habitability, we can get really complex in it, right? We can apply it on very small scales, like just the interior versus the exterior of Australia. So looking at a population density map here, you can certainly see some areas are more habitable than others. But this also varies from species to species. But then if you start to kind of zoom out and you think on planetary scales, well, obviously the Earth is habitable because we are in fact inhabiting it right now. <laughs> but Mars? as far as we know, no. Venus, which is almost identical to Earth, no, again. But again, we're not 100% sure about this. And these different planets that are in our system that we can see that we have sent rovers and orbiters to, but for exoplanets, we have way, way, way less information. So making this sort of determination about habitability is very challenging, which is very wonderfully illustrated by this image, which is uh, kind of colloquially called the planets are hard or habitability is hard image. And all of these things, go into the question of whether or not a planet might be habitable. And I'm just one person, so I cannot be an expert in all of these things as much as I would love to be. But what I can do is bring my celestial mechanics expertise to bear on my little corner of this plot, which in this case is going to be the orbital dynamics and the sibling planets. Specifically, eccentricity and then stability from the um, sibling planets. So for the kind of systems I'm going to be considering here, I'm going to be looking at systems with a star like our sun, a planet just like our Earth, and then two giant planets of varying um, properties. And so the first thing I'm considering is the stability of the system. So what does that even mean? So this is kind of an example of a system that is perfectly stable. Um, if this system was unstable, you might have planets get ejected, right? That would be unstable. Um, you might have a planet collide with a star, also unstable. Um, or you might have the planets that cross one another's orbit, which is okay, sometimes not unstable. But in this case, I will be taking it to be unstable because most of the time it is. <laughs> Um, but then, on the other hand, I'm interested in eccentricity. So how does eccentricity affect habitability? Well, you may have noticed, okay, so, oops. Um, so eccentricity is kind of playing a role here in destabilizing the system. But in fact, when I'm talking in this case, I'm talking about how eccentricity of stable systems affects the habitability. So we know that orbits are ellipses, um, and the star is that one focus of the ellipse, which means as the eccentricity gets higher, the planet is getting both closer and further away um, from the star at various points in its orbit. So if you think of this like toasting a marshmallow, right? you want it to get a nice toasty golden color, unless you're a psychopath, but if it gets too close to the fire, um, you know, you're gonna get some burnt bits, right? And no matter how far you take it away from the fire, you still have a burned marshmallow. And so this idea of marshmallow idea is kind of how we think of habitability in a broad sense for exoplanets. Except instead of a marshmallow getting properly toasted, we consider whether or not a planet can actually maintain liquid water on its surface. Um, and this 
Um, this is a pretty basic idea. Obviously, we're skipping a lot of those concepts from the habitability star concept. Um, and one in particular is that this varies with the stellar type um, or the type of star. But in this project, I was considering only sun-like stars, so I made my life a little bit easier. So as you can imagine, this uh, half-full zone area is basically going to be set by how far away the planet is from the star. Too close to the star, too hot. Too far from the star, too cold. But as we saw, eccentricity is also going to play a role. So because planets are very complicated objects, the way the habitable zone varies with eccentricity is not always straightforward. But for one thing, a planet does get a different amount of average sunlight um, depending on the eccentricity of the orbit. And so this can be described simply by something called the mean flux approximation, which I've shown here in such a way that you kind of get an equivalent um, semi-major axis that would receive the same amount of average sunlight over the orbit as an eccentric um, planet on a different semi-major axis. But it's been shown um, by quite a few authors um, that this only applies at very low eccentricities or moderately low eccentricities. <laughs> um, and in particular, about 0.6, this really seems to break down. So for eccentricities above 0.6 in this project, um, we used an analytical approximation. So you can see here, we're changing the scaling of how this varies with eccentricity. And this is based, um, this is roughly based off of some numerical climate modeling results from a 2020 study um, where we just approximated their results with a very simple scaling, which is not at all what they found, but it's just an approximation. <laughs> okay, so that tells us how to translate an eccentricity and a semi-major axis into an equivalent circular semi-major axis. But we're missing a pretty important piece here, which is what circular semi-major axis are we going to consider habitable? So for this, we turn to a pretty standard reference um, in the field that kind of set some limits on the inner edges and outer edges of the habitable zone for an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. And I'm not going to get into the details on each one of these things and what sets them, but I wanted to incorporate some of this, um, some information from each of these into my model. And so what I actually did was come up with this uh, probabilistic habitable zone model. So basically between the um, most conservative values of the habitable zone, I said the habitability, habitability probability is one. And then outside of these very um, optimistic values, I said it's zero. And then in between, it just kind of changes between zero and one. And then I added in a change of slope here to incorporate this piece of the runaway greenhouse. So this gives us a habitability probability curve. And this is what I call the unperturbed habitability because this is just a single Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. And this is what this looks like in uh, semi-major axis and eccentricity space. As you can see, we kind of have this discontinuity because we changed models <laughs> of E of 0.6. And this area up here would mean that the planet is crashing into the star, so not allowed. <laughs> okay, so how do these systems then that I'm interested in play into this? <laughs> so let's look at an example of how I consider the effect of the giant planet. So this is an example system and I've shown the properties of the system um, here on the right. Um, and so what I do is consider 80 different versions of this system where it's the exact same giant planets, but just changing the location of the earth over 80 different um, locations, kind of covering the uh, possible habitable zone area. And then I evaluate each of these 80 configurations for stability and habitability probability. So this might seem straightforward, but um, the question of stability and, and, and body systems is a pretty big outstanding problem in planetary dynamics. And I did not endeavor to solve that myself in this work, so I just tried to make use of some techniques that already exist. So first I use this two planet analytical stability criterion. Um, just for the two giant planets. So this is only applicable to two planets. And um, again, this is more math and I, I will spare you the details, but basically um, if you fail this criterion, then they, I say the system's unstable, it gets a stability result of zero and we're done with that configuration. If it passes this test, however, we go on to the next test, which is um, a Laplace Lagrange approximation that looks at the eccentricity over a billion orbits to see if there's um, any orbit crossing predicted by Laplace Lagrange. Um, and then again, if it fails this, it's unstable. If it passes, we go on to the next test. <laughs> the next test is a, uh, a tool called Spock, which is a machine learning tool um, that has been trained to predict instability on billion orbit time scales using an n-body integration of only 10,000 orbits, which is really fast, like there's nothing. <laughs> and so um, again, you're gonna get a uh, output from this, but instead of being a binary yes, no, like these first two, um, this is actually gonna give you a value between zero and one. And if it gives you a value of zero, then well, there you go, you're done, your system's unstable. But if it gives you anything other than zero, then we're gonna go on to the next step, which is this idea of spectral fraction. And so this basically uses an integration of 5 million orbits to predict stability on 5 billion orbit timescales. 
So now you're running kind of a much longer integration here, which is why this is the last step. So the idea here is you want to quit as soon as possible to save yourself time. Um, but if you can't quit, then you have to do this integration. And there are two different ways that this could give you an unstable result. So the first is sometime during those 5 million orbits, the simulation itself might go unstable, in which case you're done. Or once you finish the 5 million orbit integration, you calculate the spectral fraction, um, which I'm not going to get into the details of how that's done, but there's a certain threshold. And if you're above that threshold, then the system is unstable. If you're below that threshold, then you have a stable system. And now the result is actually set to what the output of the Spock um, prediction was. OK, so that's the stability side. On the um, habitability side, for each system that is stable, so anything that makes it to this step, we take advantage of the fact that we had to run that 5 million orbit integration. And we take the maximum eccentricity of the Earth from that simulation. We combine it with our eccentric habitable zone model that I explained to you. And this gives us a habitability probability for the system. So this is what this looks like for that example system I showed you. So this is all the locations of the Earth on the um, x-axis. On the left side, we're seeing the stability outcome. So it should be a value between 0 and 1, telling you how stable the system is. And these colors here are just indicating which step of that previous flow chart was the one that uh, gave you this 0 value. And then on the right, I'm showing the habitability probability, um, taking into account the eccentricity. So that's the orange curve. Um, and then I've showed that unperturbed curve here just for reference so you can see that it is slightly different. And we have gotten some effect from the eccentricity. And then we multiply these together. And that gives us this combined habitability probability curve. Um, there's too many abilities in this, but anyway. Um, OK, so the last thing that's remaining to do here is to integrate the area underneath this curve. You get a value from that. You can compare it to if you did the same thing for the unperturbed curve, which has a constant value of that. And then you divide those two, and you finally get a relative habitability for this giant planet configuration. So you do all of that to get this one number. <laughs> and I did this for about 150,000 giant planet configurations. Um, so there were two fiducial systems I did where I varied one parameter at a time. So those each had 530 configurations. But then the remaining 140,000, 147,456 was this enormous eight dimensional grid where I varied all of the system properties kind of in every combination. Um, and remember, I have to do this 80 times for each one of these configurations. So this was hundreds of thousands of computing hours on the um, computing cluster. So it's not a trivial effort. So what did I find? Well, OK, I'll show you this because it's a little bit easier to uh, parse. So this is one of the fiducial systems where I'm varying just a single parameter at a time. And the vertical lines here in each plot show the value that the, that property has when it's not the parameter being varied. Um, this is kind of like a lot to look at. So let's just zoom in on, on one of these plots at a time. So this first one is the semi-major axis of the inner giant planet. Um, and the property that we're keeping constant is alpha, which remember is the ratio of semi-major axis. So moving A1 also moves A2, but they move together. Um, and what we see is that as the giant planets get moved into the habitable zone, it greatly reduces the relative habitability, which is not particularly surprising, but <laughs> it is uh, good to see. And then actually this kind of local maxima here is basically because the giant planets are kind of just on either side of the habitable zone, and you do get a little bit of the middle region of the habitable zone that's still viable. Um, and so then if we look at alpha, um, as alpha gets higher, remember that means the giant planets are getting closer together. So these very high alphas are just unstable because the giant planets are just close together. And then some of these dips here that you see going across, those are actually associated with mean motion resonances, which can be destabilized. Um, and then for the eccentricity of the giant planets, we see that as you get very eccentric, you start to get completely unstable, which is, again, unsurprising. But what you actually see here is um, this feature, which I think is very interesting. So this is for the outer giant planet, Planet 2. Um, it actually has a secular resonance here that basically protects the systems um, that would otherwise be you know, unstable on either side of this resonance. So um, kind of an interesting example of how the relative habitability changes with the giant planet properties. And then with the mass of the giant planets, there's not really any sharp trends, but we do see a kind of general trend where the higher mass planets are um, just a little bit less conducive to habitability. This actually is um, because of secular resonances. And then um, with inclination, we see a huge feature here where there's just no real uh, configurations that are habitable in the metal. And this is actually um, due to something called Kozai leadoff, which I'm not going to get into today, but um, it's actually the biggest difference between this system and the next system, where the only difference here between these fiducial systems is the location of the giant planet. So if you see in panel A1 how that's moving. OK, so now the giant planets are interior to the habitable zone, which means the Earth is no longer the innermost planet. So changing its inclination doesn't really matter. <laughs> but the rest of the results here, I'm not going to get into, but they're pretty much the same. <laughs> 
Okay, so most of my computing effort went to these eight dimensional results, but as you can imagine, it's very difficult to show you some picture that can capture eight different dimensions at once because we only got two dimensions here. Um, so this is kind of the best I could do. So I reduced um, two of the dimensions by using these colors, which is easy to do because there's only two cases of each. Um, and then kind of flattened down the distribution. So vertically here, we're seeing the distribution of relative habitability. And there are some general trends you can take from this, but they're pretty similar to the trends that we saw in the fiducial system. So I'm not gonna really belabor these results here, but I will say that all of these results, the whole data set is available um, at this uh, DOI if you would like to play around with it or see anything cool in there. Um, but one last thing that I will note is that some of these distributions extend up past one, what? So these are what I call ultra habitable configurations. Um, this basically means that the presence of the giant planets actually makes the systems more habitable than they would be without any giant planets at all. There's just a single Earth-like planet. Um, and if you look at the properties of these systems, um, you can see they tend to be kind of on the smaller side giant planets that are located far out in the system, kind of moderate spacing, a moderate amount of eccentricity, and a slight preference for some amount of inclination. What's actually happening here is that with those properties, they're exciting the planets that would otherwise be here in this uninhabitable region, kind of in eccentricity space up into the habitable zone, but without exciting these planets out of the habitable zone or destabilize the planets. So this is just a really interesting result, I thought, that you could get these kind of more habitable systems um, with giant planets. So going back to this idea of habitability, this is a big interdisciplinary area of work, and I hope that I've convinced you that dynamics is not just an afterthought, it needs to be an integral part of what we consider when we're thinking about habitability. And one thing I'm just really proud of with this project is how much room there is to build on this very kind of simplistic model and develop more ideas into it on how to quantify the relative habitability from system to system. So thank you all so much for your attention today. Hopefully you've learned something about the dance of the planets and how interactions between planets can really have interesting and important effects, especially in the wide variety of exoplanet systems that we've discovered so far and the many more to come. Um, and I would just like quickly to say thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a really interesting question. Oh, so the question was, um, in our solar system, Jupiter has kind of effects on Earth impact. So how could you, or how difficult would it be to model that? Um, that was actually one of the original questions I was kind of interested in, is how that would work in exoplanet systems. Um, I think you definitely could model that, but with any modeling thing, right, it's trade-offs in what, what you can do. So if you're going to be modeling impacts and you need to model a lot of small bodies, then maybe, you know, you wouldn't be able to, to kind of look at a wide range of giant planet configurations. So I think it's just a trade-off, but you could definitely model that. Um, although I will say, so this question of Jupiter, there's a really great uh, paper series by Horner and someone else um, called Jupiter Friend or Foe that actually goes into this question. And it actually turns out they, they conclude that Jupiter is a little bit more of a foe. So <laughs> it's not as straightforward as it seems. And that's because there's different reservoirs or bodies that can impact the Earth. And Jupiter protects us from some, but um, actually increases the impact rates from others. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the question was, um, looking at the Kepler data, some of the models actually had negative uh, occurrence basically at the resonance location. And what's the uh, meaning of that? So yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And if you had a dip at resonance like that, so the dip that we found was not significant, it was consistent with being totally flat. Um, but that would basically mean you had a, a preference for not being in the resonance. And that would not be due to this effect of the like time averaging, that would probably be a stability effect. So you can get destabilizing if you get really close to resonance without actually kind of locking into it. And so that could be, um, could be at play, but we didn't actually see evidence for that, but that could give you a dip. <laughs> Um, the question was uh, for the population of Kepler-like planets, what, would, what were the resonance angles um, doing for the planets in the simulations? Um, yeah, and the answer is we didn't specifically look at that because we were more interested in kind of what the observable result would be with the period ratio sculpting. So you can kind of do that agnostic of whether or not an individual planet is in the resonance. So the question is eccentricity versus eccentricity. Um, yeah, I guess I probably say it both ways. I, I do that a lot with pronunciation. I I'm notoriously bad, and my family can vouch for this, at pronouncing words because I read far too much as a child. So, um, yeah, so I can't really pronounce words. And Anthony doesn't help because he pronounces half the things wrong anyway, and he's the person I talk to the most. <laughs> Just don't get me started on data versus data. <laughs> yeah, so the question was, um, did I use this expansion to kind of come up with stability criteria based on um, our kind of updated frequencies. Um, and the answer would be uh, no, because in this case, we were interested in the inclination frequency. And forcing something to high inclination doesn't really destabilize it. It just 
moves it <laughs> around three dimensionally. Um, but um, certainly with the eccentricity resonance, um, you would definitely get a lot of destabilization because at high eccentricities, it would, it would destabilize the system. Um, but we were mostly just interested in the inclination. Is this something that can be done? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think, I mean, and I think it would have some some stability effects because one thing that we did find is that there is coupling between inclination and eccentricity, which isn't seen in um, just Laplace Lagrange theory. There's no coupling between between the terms, but there is at higher orders there's coupling. Um, so you could in fact get eccentricity effects from this, um, but I don't know on what order that they would be. <laughs> so um, the question was um, how do these secular resonance stabilize versus destabilize the um, relative habitability? So we didn't explicitly um, look at the secular resonance as a specific destabilizer, but the spectral fraction method is kind of intended to look for long scale or long time scale instabilities that might be associated with secular resonances, particularly overlapping secular resonances. But so that kind of incorporates the idea, but it doesn't explicitly like calculate where the secular resonances are. There were a few systems that I did do that calculation for to try and better understand the results I was getting. So um, for example, when we saw the mass um, effects that it was stronger for the outer mass, this, I, I looked at some of those systems and looked, okay, these secular resonances are entering the habitable zone, they're getting close together, they might start to be overlapping. And I think that's what's happening, but it's not, it, it's kind of trying to understand the result rather than giving us the result. Yeah, so Daryl was asking about um, some, a conversation we'd had where I showed him a, a bunch of different secular resonance locations in Kepler systems. So that's definitely something that um, would be kind of some interesting follow-on work for this work um, that we did with the notable recession is to look, if you could look at a population level of the Kepler systems, where the secular resonances fall, and if you could see some sort of like cumulative effect from stacking things basically within the population, like because as things get inclined, they're less likely to transit. And so we might be missing planets that are excited in inclination due to secular resonances. Yeah, so the question was um, about the discontinuity in our eccentric habitable zone model um, and whether that's something to be concerned about. I would say, yes, that's something to be concerned about. I would say that whole model is something to be concerned about. Um, and I, I kind of had to, you know, there was a lot of things I wanted to include and that was one of the biggest pieces of doing this work was how do I include all of these different effects? And I kind of finally decided, oh, I'm just not. <laughs> And so I went with kind of very first order simplified mean flux approximation until it, we really can't justify using it anymore. And then I'm just going to come up with this approximation based on some numerical results. But I think that incorporating a better habitability model would be really exciting direction for this work. There's a lot more things that can be incorporated into that. And I know um, I've had several conversations with um, Schwann and um, Dorian over in geosciences that are very interested also in the same question of eccentric habitability and how that varies. The way that I did it, uh, the question was, how did I time average the period ratios? Um, so the way that I did it in this work was I was just running an M-body simulation. So I just, I can't remember the, I think 2000 steps or something um, over the course of three and a half years, just taking them from the simulation. So they would be the oscillating ones at exact point in time. Um, but obviously that's not feasible to do for observed systems because uh, we don't observe them at every single point in time with a, a period. In fact, we just get the period once every time you know it goes around. Um, and so one of the things that we actually did I'm never going to use my backup slides. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, so this was actually um, saying, okay, so doing that process, taking it exactly from an n-body simulation where we kind of unrealistically are able to pull the exact period ratio at any point in time, and then comparing that to this uh, method that we had of estimating the period ratio using transit times, where because you, you're combining, um, so a period ratio is looking at both of the periods, but you only get each period at a different time schedule, right? So at a single point in time, you're really not ever getting both periods to give you a period ratio. So we kind of used the transit times to kind of come up with this like rolling average period ratio. And we compared it to doing this exact one from the unbody, and we found that they actually correlate quite well. And so um, we do think that it will be possible um, to kind of use this method on real data to uh, time average the period ratios and to look at how the period ratio changes over time. But we also found that at the current point in time, the observational certainties far dominate any signal we would expect to see from this. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs>